All right, hello, my world history scholars. We are going to do a uh, quick tour of World War II here. Uh, and so we are going to be in both the European and the Pacific theaters. Um, so we are talking this box area here, the European theater, and the Pacific theater here in Japan. Um, although, as this first slide references, what I really want to emphasize is that this was a world war. And so the orange you see is the Axis powers. Um, so this is Germany and the territories that Germany conquered and their dependent territories um, and, then, and their allies here in Eastern Europe. And then Japan and the territories they conquered. Um, but in blue is everybody who is at war with the Axis. And then anywhere you, uh, so it, it, blue is anybody who's at war with the Axis. And then anywhere where you see the red letters, uh, they specifically were at war with Japan. Um, and so the only places that aren't involved in the war are those tan locations on the map. Um, and so you can see this is a very world war. Everybody is involved uh, with a handful of very, with the exception of a handful of places here. Um, and so this puts even World War I uh, it, it, it makes it, it pales. Let me try that again. Um, this makes every war before it or since pale in comparison uh, to where the fighting was going on, the numbers of people involved, um, and ultimately, as we're going to see, the numbers of people killed as well. Uh, so we'll go from Europe at the beginning and then go to Japan. Um, so this is pre-war stuff in Europe. This was part of the rise of the right that we talked about, uh, Germany's march of aggression. So Germany in the dark red here, this is them at the end of World War I. Uh, and then they add territory in the, in the 1930s. They add territory, they march into the Rhineland, they annex Austria, they take the Sudetenland, which is this area of German speakers. And the reason I'm highlighting this, this happens before the war. And this is directly related to nationalism, this concept that we've talked about, this fierce pride in one's country. Germany felt these were rightfully their territories, felt these were German territories. The vast majority of people in these territories were German. Uh, and Germany felt like it was creating its nation state. So that goal of nationalism, Germany is expanding and trying to get all Germans into it. Now, what we're going to see later um, is shortly after that, they're going to invade the rest of Czechoslovakia, which has a lot of non-Germans, mostly non-Germans, has Czechs and Slovaks. And then they're going to invade Poland and eventually much more. Uh, but at the outset, this was a nationalistic effort. Now, when they do eventually invade Poland, and then as well as when they invade France and elsewhere, um, they're going to use this tactic of Blitzkrieg, uh, which means lightning war, which is a new tactic. And if you don't have it in your chart, you should. Um, and so take six minutes and watch this uh, video on Blitzkrieg, and it will describe the tactics for you. So with their fierce nationalism and their new battle tactics and their fast-moving tanks and their Luftwaffe, um, the German army and the Axis combined uh, with Italy um, are very successful in the opening years of the war in Europe. And so after building the German Reich, the German Empire, adding Czechoslovakia, pushing throughout Europe, um, they then move and take France, <coughs> excuse me, um, very quickly. Um, they try to take the UK, they try to take Britain, excuse me guys, but are unsuccessful in breaking Great Britain. So Hitler then turns <coughs> and invades the Soviet Union. Um, at the largest extent of its territory, Germany con controls everything that's in the blue here. The Axis controls everything that's the blue here, but mostly Germany because Italy just had a little teeny bit. Um, and so they are remarkably successful at the onset of the war. So if you want to think of Germany coming out of the middle here and then expanding um, pretty much unchecked except for the UK where they didn't invade. 
when they weren't able to invade. Um, Germany is incredibly successful in the opening phases of the war. Um, now, as we're going to go to Japan, we've talked about Japan um, and their growth from the Meiji Restoration and imperialism, and then they became their own imperial power. Um, and if you look at some of the dates on here, um, this is some of the areas, excuse me, that are Japan before the war, than when they invaded Manchuria, when they invade China. Um, and then in the 40s, um, they start exploding expansion even more. Um, Japan is taking the Philippines, is taking Indies territories, uh, moving, 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 um, and then eventually is going to run into the United States territories in the Pacific as well. Um, and uh, this is ultimately going to uh, be most dramatic in Pearl Harbor. You can see way down here, um, 1941. Um, so Japan, just like Germany, is expanding out. And this started in the 30s when in China and started some of the interior islands and is expanding out. So just like Germany, expanding, expanding, expanding in the early parts of the war. Uh, that said, this is the furthest they are going to expand out, same as this is the furthest Germany is going to expand. And then after the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor, the United States enters World War I, excuse me, enters World War II, guys, that's where we are right now, uh, enters World War II, and this is going to start a collapse of in both Germany and in uh and in the Pacific. So we'll jump back to Europe real quick here. Um, when Hitler and the Germans invade the Soviet Union, uh, that is very similar to when Japan invaded or attacked Pearl Harbor. It woke up a sleeping giant. Soviet Union then is going to attack Germany and it's going to start their counterattack. Eventually, Great Britain um, is going to be able to start pushing. When the United States gets into the war in 1942 in Europe, um, it's going to start a pincher and just start a squeeze of Germany. So the same way they expanded out, now they're getting squeezed in from the uh, Eastern Front against the Soviet Union. There's a Southern Front coming up here after the defeat of Italy. Eventually the Allies open up a Western Front with the D-Day invasion. And it's just a squeeze if you're looking at the green arrows coming back. Um, the squeeze into Berlin. So over the course of uh, the next couple years of the war, 1942 to 1944, Germany is squeezed down. Uh, we're going to see the same process happen in Japan uh, starting after 1941. So starting in 1942, uh, the Allies get progressively closer and closer and closer to mainland Japan. Um, they use a practice called island hopping uh, where they don't try to take every single island, uh, but they try to take key ones. They try to take ones that they can use as air bases. Um, the United States is fighting this war um, in the Pacific, uh, not by itself, but it is taking on the lion's share of it, uh, unlike in Europe where they're sharing with the British, the French, um, and really the Red Russian Army is carrying the heaviest load in Europe. Um, but uh, the idea of island hopping was to keep getting closer, to be able to get an island and use it as an airstrip, to then use that as a base to attack the next island, um, to then use that as a base to attack the next island and eventually get closer and closer to, uh, to mainland Japan. Um, uh, the island of Okinawa is a key important island to that. Um, and it really kind of encapsulates the story of how difficult it was, especially as the Allies got closer and closer to mainland Japan. Um, this is like a, a nine, 10 minute video clip. Um, most of it is historians and the words of actual veterans of Okinawa, um, but it's also interspliced with a little uh, uh, Tom Hanks, um, among other people, among other actors for the uh, HBO series, The Pacific. Um, so go ahead and watch this. And it gives a lot of primary footage and um, just some really intense moments talking about the uh, the war in the Pacific.
Um, so one thing I want to point out about the war in the Pacific uh, was an important new weapon that totally changes the nature of warfare. Um, so all of this fighting going on in the Pacific Ocean, all of these spread out islands with hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of miles in between them, the fighting was made possible um, because of the aircraft carrier. Um, the United States, Japan, other nations have developed the aircraft carrying the into war years. Um, and it came to be the most important weapon in the Pacific um, and has really transformed modern warfare because essentially what you're doing with an aircraft carrier is you're making a situation where you have an air base and can put it wherever you want. Um, and if you don't have this, uh, the aircraft carrier and either our tactics or weapons um, of World War II, it, it should be, as well as island hopping, by the way. Um, but uh, I don't know how many of you have ever seen an aircraft carrier. I was in San Francisco when I was a kid um, and we saw the USS Enterprise. And it's just hard to put into words how big these are. They're literally floating cities. Uh, I mean, each one has their own zip code. Um, the, the larger ones actually have two barber shops. I don't know why that strikes me as how big it is, but like, this just gives you a general idea of the uh, of the size of it. Um, that's a football field sitting on the aircraft carrier. What blew my mind the most was how tall it was, just how absolutely um, it, just enormous out of the water it is. Um, uh, there's multiple battles, multiple naval battles, they were called. Um, in World War II where the ships of the Japanese and the United States never even saw each other. It was fought completely by planes going back and forth from the aircraft carriers to the, uh, to the enemies. Um, and I just think this is a cool chart that kind of shows the, oh, sorry, wrong one. Um, that kind of shows the dominance that the United States had. Um, this is naval ship production during World War II. So this is while the war is going on. Um, and you see just, especially, I mean, in all the categories, um, but especially in the aircraft carrier, um, just the absolute advantage that American industry, American population, um, and the fact that they were separate from all of the combatants um, gave them. And so this is 22 aircraft carriers that they made during the war, um, which just pales, uh, puts everybody else um, way behind. Uh, <clears throat> so I know that was a very quick run through of World War II, uh, but that's the essential parts of the story for our conversation. Uh, moving on tomorrow, we will talk about ethnic violence and we will talk about the casualties, especially civilian casualties. Uh, and then we will talk about the bomb as well. Um, so make sure you get those parts of your chart done. If they are not, you should have some time in class today to work on that. Uh, and we will see you guys soon.